Yeah, it's working. Thank you for hanging me today. Um, uh, yeah, I will be uh, talking a bit about the changes uh, as as uh, I was always already introduced. Um, how uh, the problems of uh, the KO platform in Sweden and uh, the many service operators and, and how how we keep uh, more than a thousand IPv4 pools filled. So um, first to create a picture of uh, the current design of uh, KO. Uh, KO uh, is the platform used to deliver FTTX uh, in a open market where service providers can uh, can pitch in or, or uh, lease accesses from us. It's, it started around uh, 2004, um, all with uh, point to point uh, fiber connections or uh, uh, in some cases uh, uh, fiber to the basement. Uh, 100 megabit switches. Uh, we still have some of these old switches in production and few, few agreements. Um, back then, uh, ADSL and VDSL was the big thing, so um, a lot of the service model around it was uh, copied from ADSL, meaning TV service had its own PVC, or in, in the case of Ethernet VLAN, uh, VoIP service also its own VLAN, and with these layer two separations also you spend a lot of uh, IP addresses on sessions uh, for various equipment. Um, something not good f with IPv4. Um, also something uh, that you did back then is that the service intelligence is uh, it's mostly placed in the access node. So uh, you have a, a stupid uh, layer two domain with some uh, service edge uh, that does almost nothing, and in the access node you do uh, uh, the limiting of how many IP addresses uh, the customer can have, uh, the bandwidth of the service, uh, and s some of the other service uh, features to not mix traffic from different customers and to identify customers. Um, in this old design, each uh, service provider or, or even service needed to have one VLAN in every single switch all over the, the country. Um, so uh, this, is, this is what the majority of the platform is, is today, how it's, uh, it's, it's implemented. Um, some of the motivations, we, we wanted to do a redesign of that because there, uh, it's... Uh, it's not an option to wait for all switches to be replaced. Even nowadays, you, if you had the money to replace them, you, you can't get them because there's not enough chips or other problems. Um, service design became increasingly differentiated or complicated because every time you want to do something new, you had to test it on 40 plus uh, switch platforms. Um, from different mergers and just old stuff that we keep around. Um, many of these switches are so old, so uh, uh, nobody knew about IPv6 when they developed it. So there was, since we have the service intelligence in the switches, uh, you can't really do any IPv6 implementation based on, on that. Um, then more and more I don't know if it's a market trend in, or if it's just because T is getting more and more service providers, but we were facing that, that more and more uh, service providers were needing to be put into this platform and then some of, uh, some or lots of equipment. Uh, we are talking really old A6, but uh, you can have limits of uh, 100 VLANs or stupid stuff in old equipment. Uh, so we were simply running out of resources. Uh, and then again with this design, there were 
300 service edges and uh, 60 service providers and trying to keep IP addresses uh, filled on, on these, it's a huge task. Uh, so we, there was different hacks for all sorts of things, or there is, because uh, a lot of this is still in, in production and how it's working for today, or today. Um, the new design is uh, so that we extensively use Q and Q. Each customer has their own VLAN. Uh, But it, it, the, the access switches, the FTTX uh, network comes much simpler. It's a pure layer two thing. There's very limited service intelligence. Doesn't really, it's not 100% true because there, we still have multicast TV, even though Netflix is uh, trying to take over <laughs> uh, with their streaming services. We still have uh, people wanting to watch uh, the same football match, uh, one million people at the same time, we need multicast to some extent. Um, so, uh, so the new design is based around that we still have a, a little service intelligence in, in the access network. Um, but we want to, to have lesser uh, service edges, so we are downscaling from, from the current 300 to 60, 70, Ish. Um, one of the things we, we, we really wanted in the new design was, was support for native IPv6. We've been running tunneling. I don't know if you remember I talked about it at this conference five years ago. We've been running tunneling services for a long time, but after Netflix uh, and YouTube started IPv6, the tunnel service is not really, doesn't really scale. Um, one of the things we want, it's a huge problem in Sweden that people, they connect their cable to the wrong port on these, uh, I, if you are from Sweden, you probably know these uh, CPs you have at home or, or um, service plate or I don't know what you should call it in English. But um, we changed that so all the ports are the same. There's one you and I, and the, the separation between the different service and service providers are on the BNG or further into the network. Um, so this allows something called free seeding, which is um, yeah, gives less support and in the end maybe more ha happy customers. Uh, the challenge we are facing, uh, we need to help these 60 service providers. Uh, some of them have, have lots of IPv4 addresses. Uh, some of them have uh, very few, uh, and uh, nobody hopefully has too many. Uh, so, so this demand for very effective usage of the IPv4 space. You can't pre-provision large bunch of addresses uh, uh, into thousands of pools. Um, and from not being allowed to, to, to pre-provision a lot, uh, it's also so that people can go to some portal and they can change uh, the service provider in a 15 minute uh, basis. So uh, it, it doesn't really count if one does it, but sometimes many customers, they move around and then one day they add one service provider and another day they add another service provider. So there was a lot of work with all this uh, IPv4 exhaustion. So for the new platform, we rethought a little bit this, how we would do it. Um, we have two different solutions. A service provider, they can have their own DHCP server. Um, and there's one solution for that. And then we, as a communication operator, also offers to manage the DHCP server, uh, meaning that the, we are just handed a bunch of addresses, and then we will we will have to find out how what to do with those. Um, so the service provider managed DHCP option is so that we don't know actually what ranges or what the service provider has of IP address. That is all dynamic. So our BNG will learn the the route based off the answer from the service provider's uh, DHCP server, put that into the, the uh, 
the routing table as a slash 32. Um, the BNG will force all traffic upstream by doing proxy up. So basically whatever the service provider put in as a default gateway, the BNG will just say, hey, that's me. So uh, uh, one thing that is statically configured is the GI addresses, but that is just some internal private space. Nobody really cares that, that uh, we ag agree with the, with the service providers that, hey, all the GI addresses are, are from within this range, and then each BNG just gets a 32 from that. Um, but then having million subscribers, it tends to be a lot of slash 32 routes. You probably don't want them everywhere. So we do a lot uh, controlling of these uh, slash 32 routes and where they are loaded. So they are only in the routers that really need them. So that means, uh, I don't know if I can point here. Yeah. Uh, the BNGs are down here with the subscribers. They just know about themselves. Uh, and the NNIs, so the rest of the network, there will be, of course, there's route reflectors and, you know, BGP, but, but they will not be in FIPS uh, except for these key places. So that's a vital uh, point. And uh, it will also be so that Sweden is divided into technical areas. So depending on how many peering points the service provider has, it, we will also limit. So the slash 32 routes are only in those areas where, where they're needed. Um, but since we as a KO now knows nothing about these IP ranges, they will just, all of, all of the slash 32 routes will be directly forwarded to the service provider, so we will do no aggregation. So a service provider will have to do that if they want aggregation. Probably they do because the rest of the internet can't take these 32 routes. Um, and one other thing, in order to have this high scaling that the customers don't actually know about each other, we are doing a, a split horizon routing, so uh, all traffic goes upstream on the BNG. There is no local round trip or anything, Every, that, but that was also a requirement from some of the service providers, because if they want to do filtering on what ports the customers could do and could not do, there, there can't be any local routing in, in the KO network. Um, this also includes, includes the default gateway. There is no default gateway in the KO network. So if the customer looks up their IP address and ping, pings the, the default gateway, it doesn't actually exist within the KO network. But then again, service providers are free to set up whatever they put into the DCP server as a loopback somewhere in the network so the subscribers can, can ping. Uh, something that is done in support and uh, it doesn't really matter. If you are really short on IP address, you can actually also reuse that default gateway at some other customer, so they will just ping each other. <laughs> you don't need any default gateway. <laughs> uh, um, the next thing is for uh, when the communication operator is handling the, the DHCP. We do this completely different. <laughs> uh, we are given a large pool from service providers. We put that into a one big large pool for the entire country. Um, centralized in a orchestration system. Uh, and this is then uh, based on needs subnet it into smaller chunks, and there's some different rules with assignment size. If it's a very small operator, it can be slash 28. So if it's a big service provider, it can be slash 22 or, or larger. Um, then when we install new BNGs, it has no addresses. It's completely empty, and based on demand, we will fill these, these pools. Um, then... I don't know if it was, was planned from NetNode, but some of the things that, that Peter was talking about in the previous slide, we're doing a lot of this automation. And, and uh, so what we do when, when we need to assign new addresses, uh, we find out that out based on uh, one of these APIs, NetConf. Uh, 
where you can actually, via netconf, you can ask the device, hey, uh, send me a uh, notification to the orchestration system. So real time, you'll get a stream of, of events from the, from the device, the BNG in this case. And uh, in this uh, instance, uh, it is uh, an unknown pool. We don't know the pool. This is some lab equipment. But it's a very, compared to talking to a CLI or trying to pass some lock thing, or uh, it's very well formatted. Uh, you know exactly what pool it is. You know exactly what, what node it is and, and all these things. So it's, there's not so much fuzzy logic involved. You know directly what uh, what was the problem, and in this example, it was uh, the pool doesn't exist at all. Maybe it's a new BNG or it's a new service provider uh, on that BNG. Uh, so this notification goes into our uh, uh, orchestration system, and we will, from the large countrywide pool, we will take out suitable slash twenty four. Um, and we will also with uh, netconf no CLI uh, also do, done with, with APIs and one of the things that you can do with netconf if it's uh, well implemented in the devices these things can actually be much faster than doing stuff with, with CLI. Um, we do a lot of checks and uh, if, if all passes we, we put this pool in and it takes uh, normally around four seconds. So the first or the second DHCP request from the customer in an area where there's no IP addresses, they might be ignored. Uh, but the, and then booting a Windows PC or starting some residential gateway router or something, that, that's usually four seconds. Is, uh, nobody notices that. Um, and then I, I put in just an example of uh, uh, customers, they are, they tend to uh, to be more uh, active in the evening, uh, probably because they are going to watch some Netflix. So in the in the middle of the evening, we ran out of uh, addresses at this uh, place uh, here in Stockholm, and uh, we put in a new slash twenty four, and and instantly the customer can can use that, and it will be routed uh, in in BGP and. Um, but we then get into, uh, we also need to return addresses. Uh, and with, this is still an in, internal discussion with, with our IP registry, how we should handle this. But customers, as I mentioned before, they are moving around. They can, uh, maybe not, the, since this is a FTTX platform, the customer is actually not physically moving, but they go from one operator to another, and, and in large scale, it becomes a problem, and uh, suddenly you have too many IP addresses in some area uh, where they are not needed. But things like uh, returning addresses, it's uh, customers, are, yeah, most customers actually don't notice, doesn't notice if, if you're watching Netflix or YouTube or anything, you don't see it. Uh, but some VPN clients, if you change IP address, it, they are not happy. You need to reinitialize your session. Uh, but what we do is that we look on a weekly basis, uh, and then it is automated to an extent that we just say, now we want to do this task, optimize the IP addresses in this area or in this uh, service provider, and then we will return the addresses in a, a nice way also done with the with the telemetry and, and uh, netconf uh, APIs for the devices that we will stop handing out new addresses and, and uh, give subscribers from some of the, the subnets that are going to stay there. Uh, and this normally takes around half an hour. We have a least, least time of, of 20 minutes. Um, and then once the subnet is completely empty, it will be returned and put into the pool. Um, we are planning to fully automate this, but it, it's really a balance between not disturbing the customers and not doing mo too much work uh, on our part. Because uh, it's, it's very easy to do this every week, but uh, uh, not 
it's maybe not needed because there could be plenty of addresses free uh, and maybe it disturbs the customer too much to change IP address. Because potentially an unlucky customer could change IP address every Sunday night or when, which is usually when we run this kind of thing. Uh, so what is happening with this platform? Uh, we have started migrating into it. We are just numbers are all, always a bit, uh, is it the online ports or is it uh, also ports where we have no subscribers and but but around 20% is actually done and um, uh, into this platform that we we call Gecko. Uh, you mean some cool? I'm not native Swedish, but uh, they like these names. Uh, uh, but there's still um, a million plus ports left. Uh, I don't know if we will manage, but we are planning to take a large part of that uh, next year. Um, so yeah, also a bit short, but that was uh, what I had planned to present. I don't know if there's any questions or it's all too, too diffuse. <laughs> Question on Menti? No, it works better if you turn it on in both ends. Uh, yeah, question from Ante. Uh, they wonder how do you handle CGNAT addresses between operators? So I'm guessing if there are overlapping uh, private addresses into different of your service providers' space. Um, based on lock, it's pro it's only really a problem in the case where this this same custom what would get the same CGNet address from two operators because we are on the first link into the BNG doing this separation between uh, uh, the services and if, if so yes potentially it could be if uh, if the exact same CGNet address is handed out to two different service providers on the same home connection but we took a chance on that. <laughs> we have a question from Nina. So can you explain how you handle resiliency? Because you're moving from small devices with not that many customers on to big devices with a lot of customers on. Have you thought about how you secure that you not have a big chunk of people being down at the same time in case of failure? Uh, the new BNGs are always set up in a redundant pair scenario. So they will be active active taking around 30,000 customers each of ports. Uh, and then in a failover scenario, they, they will move the traffic. And, and we, we uh, nothing is perfect, uh, but, but we, have, we, we, have, we have managed to do software upgrades during the day because we can actually move and there is a, a 300 millisecond outage for the customer. And we hope that uh, that team session wasn't that disturbed. Um, but but, but uh, so that, that's what we do. And they are also in bunkers and uh, <laughs> two different places. <laughs> Swedish way. Mm -hmm. Swedish way. At the front here. So 20% of your network is now IPv6 enabled. Yes. So they get IPv6 addresses. Yes. And if, if ISPs they... are supposed to deliver IPv6 addresses from their address pool. Is that a requirement? To be connected to your KO? No. We, uh, but IPv4 is. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. My, me, technically, I would say yes, we, we could. We haven't tried it, but yes, we could take in a uh, IPv6 only service provider, but yeah. we have not gotten that question. Because IPv6 is. Uh, KOs has been hard working against IPv6. So this is a change now. So now we can have it. At, how do you know if you have this connection from via T Tilia at KO? And is support updated that you can get it and get support from it? Uh, you, you can get support with your uh, connection. Uh, 
Yeah, regardless. either it's, it's IPv4 and I can, yeah. uh, I, can, I can turn on my router and get IPv6. Yeah, but not all service providers okay. do have IPv6. Shouldn't that, shouldn't that be a requirement from the provider as IPv4 is? Uh, yes, I, I, but I can't force them. <laughs> yep, <just. laughs> that would be, a, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about speeds higher than one gigabit? Now when we're getting routers with two and a half and five gigabits for home. Yeah. Uh, as such, in this design, it's not a, a problem. It's more a, a chip delivery issue. Okay. Uh, we have everything uh, tested and, and uh, ready, ready for that up till 10 gig. So how do you know if your KO is connected with this Gecko system? Gecko? Uh, How can I fi fi figure that out? So I can push my ISP for IPv6 that's now enabled. Uh, <laughs> if you find me privately, I can, I can maybe look it up. Uh, it's okay, <laughs> I've written down your email address, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but uh, I, uh, the, yeah, the thing is that uh, uh, yeah, is also very GDPR uh, prone, so I have Yep. I have access to some uh, uh, technical numbers, uh, significant for addresses. I have no clue about who is who. <laughs> nope, no. Okay, so. thank you. Great. Well, we've hit our time. Uh, please join me in thanking Christopher for the presentation. Thanks, Christopher. <laughs> thank you.